Hi, everybody, and welcome. Hello. Milton. Hello, hello. Hey. Welcome, Milton, to our class conversations for our digital literary arts course. As you know, we're inviting a bunch of artists and writers, scholars, poets, lots of interesting people to come and talk to us about their ideas relating to literature, digital, and art. <laughs> um, we've had a bunch of interesting speakers this week, and we're very, very happy to have today Milton Laufe uh, joining us. Elita will do a brief introduction, and we'll get on with some questions for you. So thank you for being here yes. with us. No, thank you for having me. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Great. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Milton. So uh, for those of you who don't know him yet, <laughs> you're about to. Uh, Milton Laufer is an Argentinian writer, journalist, and educator that currently lives in Berlin. He has published articles and short stories in Esquire, Vice, Guernica, CIA Revista, and Otra Parte, among other publications. His digital work has been exhibited and studied widely around the world. He also earned a creative writing MFA at New York University, where he is currently a PhD candidate. Uh, his research focuses on digital literature in Latin America. He was also the 2016-2017 writer in residence at the, the Trope Tank at MIT. In 2015, he published Lagunas, a partially algorithmic generated novel, which, as most of his work, is available online at miltonlaufer.com.ar. His second computer-generated novel, a, a Sound Such as a Man Might Make, was published just down the road from where I live in Counterpass. Uh, welcome, Milton, and again, thank you so much uh, for joining us to, to have this conversation with us, and our students. Thank you again. Uh, Milton, since Milton is joining us from Party Town, it seems, I'm going to be muting you while I'm asking the questions so we don't hear the, the music. So please remember to unmute yourself when you answer the questions. So thank you so yes. much for that. <laughs> um, you see, in Berlin, it's always like that, right? It's always a party. Mm -hmm. That's my my uh, impression of the city. <laughs> uh, it's not like that, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm in a public space and there is music. I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't I couldn't make it any other way. You no, know, it's totally fine. It's just that otherwise I can't ask. The, I can I can make the question. So, um, okay, um, let's see. Uh, our first question for you is in relation to your actually trajectory. You've been making liter well, you're making electronic literature or digital literary acts for a while now, as author of solo pieces as well as collaborator of some important practitioners in the field. You have also published non-digital work, let's say, so short stories and so on, um, created without the direct collaboration of machines, let's say, although there's always been some sort of word processing involved, I'm guessing. Uh, tell us a little bit about this uh, artistic trajectory of yours. How did you start writing? And what is the relationship between your different approaches to writing? <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, That's an interesting question because it's like I have to really uh, go very deep into my this uh, long story that I already have. I'm a, I'm already 41. Uh, so and happy um, birthday! Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was a couple of days ago. Um, <clears throat> so, well, I mean, I don't know if I have an answer to one of those questions, which is why I started writing, or what is my real relation with relationship with writing <clears throat> in the sense that uh, my father was a writer so I grew up in an environment where you know writing was there you know, books and writing was all around us uh, also my father was also a, a, a visual artist that I, I don't know I always I always thought about him as the as most like mainly a writer um, so i don't know for me the idea of writing the idea of putting words together was you know, always there um and, and now that you're asking that particular question i I'm, i think that I, ha I actually have to think about that but to, to answer that part it was something that i was always there um and so yeah i mean i, I like I always tell the same story, but like uh, when I was very young, I also started uh, uh, because I, I I don't know like I, I had a, 
I think that, that some of you know this, but I, I, I have a, like a couple of short stories, even like a uh, like tiny theater place when I was very, very young, like six or something like that, talking about uh, a little bird and things like that. Uh, so it's something that has been there for, forever. And, and then when I was seven, I started programming. And these two things, you know, they, they were always there, like in a parallel way, but they were always there. Um, you know, I, I, I remember when I was 16, I published uh, a collection of poems, and I was also writing some stories, and, and I was working in, in, in novels that I could never finish them back then. And so I always had these two things, and of course, I, even if I, I, I use computers to create uh, 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 some of my, well, most of my work, I have to say, um, you know, there is a pleasure that I still have uh, in, the, in, the, in the action of actually putting one word after the other, and, you know, creating this, this music and this sense. Uh, I don't know, it's an experience that is very particular and I, I, I still really enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, so uh, when I was, I think that, yeah, I was, uh, I was about to get 21. I, it's interesting too, the other day I wrote to the artist that I'm going to mention now, but I wrote to him telling him that it's been exactly 20 years since we started working together. Uh, and this artist is Gustavo Romano, he's an Argentinian uh, artist. Uh, when I met him 20 years ago, after some time, I, I found out that he was using computers to create art. Uh, and it's interesting, I mean, we're talking about the year 2000, and I don't know, I, it never occurred to me before that you could actually use computers to, to make art. And when I saw the things that he was doing, I was really, you know, blown out. You know, it was, it was, yeah, it, it was a paradigm that I hadn't even considered, considered by back then. So, uh, um, and then I thought, oh, well, I could do the same, you know, to, to create literature, um, which, on the other hand, had. A, and of course this is very personal, but had a lot to do with something that I didn't like. One of the things that I didn't like about writing uh, uh, literary text, which was that um, it, it was always hard to me to choose one word instead of the other. Not in the sense that maybe one word is better or it's more precise or you know, things like that, but in the sense that Sometimes, you know, one word had some meaning that I actually wanted to have, what wanted to put on that text. And then another word had another meaning that I also wanted to put. And there was this like, why do I have to choose between them? And, and the good thing about uh, uh, creating text with the computer is that sometimes you don't have to. Like, you can just uh, have all of them in your text, not, not on, each text, but in the in the set of all of them, that is uh, uh, usually uh, uh, you know the result of creating this type of uh, uh, algorithmic uh, 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 piece. So I don't know. It, it was an interesting uh, um, uh, path journey to me to to, to find that. Um, so yeah. Um, and what is the difference between these two types of, uh, uh, um, of practices? Uh, that's a very good question. I mean, of course, one is the one that I already said. Um, but, but on the other hand, when I create things using the computer, uh, it's, it's like a total different uh, 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 mental paradigm because basically when and, and this is something that we, we discuss um, with Alex sometimes that I, I, I really like, I really like, uh, uh, um, you know, like generative literature with the 
or generative electronic literature, which basically is the one that produces uh, a text. And, and, and when you do that, the way in which you think about the, the, the words and the textual structure uh, is totally different. It's like you, you are thinking more in terms of possible combinations and, and it's totally and completely different to the way in which you think when you when you're like setting um, it's not unique but let's call it like that like a unique text you know when you're writing uh, uh, a text in the uh, uh, traditional way so um, that's another difference uh, that's another difference between these two practices but yeah, I mean, I, we, we could go on and on about this, but, but I think that these two particular things are, are probably the most important. You know, the fact, first, the fact that in a traditional text, you have to actually, uh, you know, uh, exclude a, a very big number of words and, you know, choose only one, which is uh, a, a very hard decision to make. Uh, that would be one difference that in general generative electronic literature doesn't have. And the other one is that the, the, the type of structures that you are thinking on is totally different when you do electronic literature. You are thinking more in terms of, of how things can couple together. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, it's a totally different paradigm. Um, mm -hmm. This ties in very well with the second question that, that we prepared. And we were thinking about your, uh, your novels like Lagunas or A Sound Such as a Man Might Make uh, that are uh, generated, uh, computer generated that is. So how, I mean, how do you understand then your role as author in, in works like this and just in general with uh, computer generated um, electronic literature? Um, I mean, that's a great question. And I, I won't presume that I have a definite answer because, <laughs> my, no, no, but, but I'm being very honest because basically I feel that in, just to give you one, like, just to talk about these two novels that you're, you're referring to, uh, I actually have more uh, computer-generated novels, but uh, you know those two are the most, to say, important. But um, uh, I mean, my role in each one of them was totally different. Like in Laguna, Laguna was first. It was like a, let's call it like a hybrid, no, hybrid, hybrid, I don't know, hybrid novel, uh, in the sense that. Half of the novel is a traditional novel. It was written in the traditional way, and it's like the the, the you know the, the backbone of Laguna. It's a, like a traditional novel, and then uh, the other part, which is the one that is computer generated, uh, was also uh, written by me. Um, and for instance, in the case of Lagunas, uh, uh, the the way the, the the combinatory algorithm didn't go inside the sentences. It was uh, mm -hmm. it combined sentences in different ways, mm -hmm. and it was actually uh, uh, it took me like a long time. I'm talking about probably a little bit less than two years, but it took me a while to to create this algorithm. Um, and uh, so, but it doesn't go inside the sentences. And in this, in this sense, even if the result could be, even for me, at sometimes you know, uh, 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 something that I didn't, uh, I didn't see coming, uh, um, it is still something that I wrote. It is still a sentence that I actually wrote. Um, Whereas in, in um, uh, I know it's just a man made make, make um, the sentences are completely, uh, first, there are two things. First, the source text that I used were written by other people, uh, you know, 
very good writers. Uh, 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 and, and so that was the first thing that it was different. And the second one was that it goes inside the sentences, uh, which creates way more meaning uh, than the ones that you can create with the algorithm that I use in Laguna. So, um, in, 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 so what I wanted to say is that in Lagunas, I, I really feel that I like I'm I, I'm the author even in the traditional sense. I mean, mm -hmm. I I wrote every sentence in that book, and I even created the algorithm that uh, uh, produces the book. In Anoisit Command Made Lake, my role was different. I mean, uh, first it was the fact that I I I. I I realized that these two novels uh, had a lot of things in common that were that could, you know, work well together. Um, so uh, that was like in, in the first thing. I'm more like a DJ than, you know, a traditional author in terms of of an artist to demand make. make. Um, then the algorithm that I use. Uh, it's a very well-known algorithm. It's basically uh, this uh, Markov chain, uh, which I I have to say that I didn't use it in the traditional way. I I, I did some changes, uh, which are basically uh, just to summarize this, what I invented here. But basically, the length of the of the chains that you use, you can you know decide which length you want to use. And the length that I use, um, so if, if the length is, is you know, if, if it's very long, then you get more, uh, um, you know, uh, you get sentences that have more sense, but usually they are more like the third thing that you put there. Uh, so, and if the, if the chains are very short, then the results are more unexpected, and in one sense you get more, you know, uh, something new but then you go more into the nonsense. And what I did is that I created an algorithm that was like, like alternating between long, uh, uh, um, uh, long chains and short chains. And uh, as far as I know, that's not something that has been done uh, uh, at least many times. Uh, usually people, they use uh, like a, a, a fixed length. Um, so in that sense, I, I did some uh, you know tweaks to the algorithm, but on the other hand, it wasn't my algorithm. Uh, mm -hmm. So and the next thing that is different uh, uh, with in regards of, of um, uh, noise system and make make is that I actually edited the the result. Very it, it was very minor, but mm -hmm. I did some editing there. Whereas in Lagunas, that didn't have that doesn't happen with the version that people have. So what I'm trying to say is that my role uh, could be very, very different depending on which, what exactly mm -hmm. I'm doing with the, with, the, the, with the text. It doesn't seem to be like, I, 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 at least until now, I don't have a, a, a unique answer to that question. I mean, it's, it's something mm -hmm. that changes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's so interesting, I mean, because uh, a noise such as a man might make, uh, I mean, now that it's published by Counterpath, I guess mm -hmm. in a way, you know, that that act of publishing, you know, in a in a press and publishing it in paper, sort of makes you more like this authorial figure. Even though you're saying that your role was a little bit more hands off than it was in in Lagunas, which is it's an interesting paradox <laughs> and no, a function I mean, uh, of uh, uh, and a function of the medium, which is very interesting because basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I, I don't know exactly how to say this without sounding weird, but uh, in a way, <laughs> uh, but in a Just way, I, feel, I, I but I really felt that more people started to take me, you know, to take me seriously after I published this second book, which in my mind, I mean, even if I, I do, I, I like this book and I'm, I'm very happy to have have it published and I, 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 I'm very happy to have it published in that collection you know the, all the people are publishing there are you know 
people that I really admire. So sometimes it's weird to see my name in that list. Uh, but but it's but it's in a way it's interesting that um, that made me more um, let's put it this way how, uh, 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 more respectable. I don't know more. Uh, it's like mm -hmm. I became more a real artist after that. After you printed, but, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, and it's this 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 thing that you know uh, publishing houses have like. The fact that they are uh, um, uh, legitimatory, I don't know how to say it, uh, 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 entity. It's, it's mm -hmm. yeah. Not, yeah. Yeah, it's so, it's so interesting. interesting. Yeah, it's so interesting to think about, I mean, that as a function of the medium and of the, mm -hmm. I guess, the network just of uh, publishing and what it means uh, still culturally very, very much um yeah. in terms of yeah leg legitimization in terms of uh distribution in terms of recognition yeah. and so on so on yeah circulation yeah. and access also it's a work that you cannot read on your website well the rest of your work is free so i want to <laughs> keep on touching on this idea of materialization and rematerialization in our next question because a lot of your pieces investigate um let's say various forms of expression and how they complement or they morph into each other. I'm thinking of pieces like figurative language and code, where we see a sort of recodification of words into image, code, sound. Can you tell us more about the processes of dematerialization and rematerialization at the base of these works? Um, yeah, let me think it's about a 10 point question. question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm, 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 and yeah, in I'm, English, so it's like it's, it's a hundred point question because I know we're making you work hard. <laughs> no, 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 please. Uh, um, uh, no, I'm, I'm just thinking that, um, as you said, like most of most of my uh, work uh, is is in in some sense. Uh, immaterial, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, but we both know, and I, I, I heard you talking about this, that of course this virtuality or immateriality metaphor is, is of course misleading because it's not, and that's a way of uh, making invisible all the processes that are uh, going on behind this and all the, uh, you know, all the con consequences that this can have. You know, the, the energy that Google is uh, 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 using every day is just insane, and that's because it's mm -hmm. not the material at all. So just to give you one example of this. But um, um, I don't know. I mean, uh, let's put it this way. Um, I, and this is also a personal answer, and, 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 uh, and this is interesting because one thing that I realized uh, today I was thinking, uh, of, of course, I'm, I'm going a little bit out, of, you know, out of my way for just for a second. But I realize that I'm starting to to think about this, uh, my 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 relationship with this practice, practice in more like um, uh, personal terms, um, because my, my latest work is, is becoming more more um, more personal. I don't know. I, I, it's something that is been happening. So anyway, I, I'm just saying this because my answer was going to be that I uh, one thing that I did like I think that 13 years ago, my thesis, my philosophy thesis, was about the Tractatus of Wittgenstein, and um, and there is one quote that I actually used in one piece in code in the Codio uh, that says that you know that there is some type of uh, isomorphism between our different means of expression, you know? And, and I, I, one thing that I actually, I'm always like, even if I know that it's impossible, I, I'm always inclined to try is to find this uh, 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 common ground, this like, uh, uh, what 
first thing that I would call the logical figure, you know, the logical mm -hmm. structure uh, that is between, that, that, that is common to many ways of expressing something. Um, you know, maybe because I, I have this tendency to, to all philosophy where you know, people were looking for an essence of things, but I, I do like to find this, this structures that you can say that are, that are common to, to certain things. So to give you a more uh, concrete answer, you know, as you said, like um, uh, Código, for instance, code uh, translates text to uh, numbers and bring those numbers to music. You know, uh, figurative language translates words into images. Um, so, of course, I, I wouldn't say that this you know, there are very, you know, super successful attempts, but they are actually, at least they are pointed to, to this direction to, to have a common ground, which is actually, um, and this is not uh, included in, in your question, but it's actually that I've been thinking a lot lately, uh, which maybe, maybe we can discuss that, uh, after, but, you know, the fact that I, Sometimes I feel that one problem that we are facing, in, like in terms of a, like a big society that is the war right now, uh, is that we we are not finding this common space, this common ground. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, and I would say that in that sense, it's also something appealing to me. Um, right. I mean, something that we were talking about a little bit is kind of like the sort of the failures of discourse in contemporary society, right? Speaking doesn't work anymore. So this is an interesting sort of reflection in your work, right? I mean, it is all about language, of course, but it's not necessarily all about discourse in the traditional sense. So that's, that's an interesting um, sort of afterthought of just something that you said right now. Mm -hmm. And it also, I was also thinking as you were talking, Milton, about how um, how really a very, very large majority of your work is uh, bilingual, uh, which has been, uh, I mean, for me as a, as, a, as a professor that has to deal with students that have various um, levels of uh, Spanish language, particularly at the undergrad level, it's really uh, amazing how there is also this linguistic bridge always in your work. Um, so I don't know if you want to say something about your uh, your your choice to to publish your work to make your work bilingual. Um, well, I mean it's it's, it's interesting because um, that I guess that I didn't think about that you know aspect of my work the fact that it's bilingual and and that I actually. And this is uh, this is like an announcement, but I'm trying. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm really I'm really trying to make it trilingual right now. I'm German actually, on top of it all. German is going to. Oh, I mean, I want to yes. excellent! Hebrew. Yeah, come on, but, just throw it in there. <laughs> Hebrew. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the only thing that I remember how to say, like I speak uh, Hebrew. Uh, so no, but but the thing is that I I I, I so in one sense the the the, the, the I mean there there is a trivial explanation uh, about why English appeared there, and it's just because it's easier to create uh, computer generated text in English because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know the syntax is is is, is you know in some sense uh, simpler you know. There is no, there are no genders in the in the wars, and all that stuff makes things easier. Um, um, but on the other hand, I mean, I, I would, and as you can see right now, like English is not a comfortable language to me. Uh, so um, I guess that I guess that the fact that I I've been doing that had to do with that, with the fact that I, I mm -hmm. I'm still trying to. To get to communicate, and, and and on the other hand, it's interesting because even if even if English became the the the, 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 the lingua franca of the world for the for may, maybe for bad reasons, you know, historically it wasn't nice the way it became like this. That 
uh, but it is. So in a way, um, it is in some, somehow the common ground that we can find between people from all around the world. For instance, here in Berlin, it's very interesting. Like uh, uh, nobody speaks very good English, but everybody speaks in English. Like most of the time, you're speaking in English, and, uh, mm -hmm. and hmm. so it, 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 it is really something that uh, became somehow, in a way, a, a, a common ground. People to, you know, for people to communicate, but I mean, and the, the, I could give more reasons about this. But I, I, yeah, I think that it's interesting that you uh, you notice that there is a relationship between the fact that it's bilingual and the fact that I'm interested in these intersections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should I go? Yes, just yeah, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> um, I, I think that's a, a very good segue also about like, you know, the political dimension of choosing a language or not with the question that Alex is going to ask now. Oh, you can ask it. It's the same. Oh, it's or okay. I can ask it. Yes. Go for I was it. Go trying for to it. Be, go for it, girlfriend. Be, you know, fair. <laughs> uh, I mean, this, this has to do with... Um, uh, I mean, language obviously has political dimensions and, and particularly if we're talking about lingua franca or, you know, hegemony of uh, English or, you know, whether Spanish is still an imperial language and so on. It's these are kind of like notions that um, I guess Latin Americans are always like struggling with, with this politicization of uh, on the one hand language, but also I guess, of, of technology. And we wanted to ask you about um, the ideas of politicization of Latin American work uh, that you have been researching for a while and I've seen you uh, talk about them uh, a couple of times. And, um, and, and I guess where we see that the most is in, in this installation piece, uh, La Industrialización de América Latina, uh, that I was lucky to see in, in, in Querétaro when we were there. So anyway, all of that to say, to, uh, to ask you really, what, what do you think about the relationship between politics and the material conditions of Latin America uh, have to do with uh, electronic literature, digital literary arts also from Latin America? Um, yeah, no, no, it's true that that's something that I've been uh, at least trying to think about. Um, um, I mean, there are many aspects of it. I, w one of the things that you asked was that um, um, the fact that um, you know choosing a language is itself a political message, you know, and 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 it, it's interesting because w w one of the reasons why uh, you know with time most of my my pieces started to be in English was the fact that I was living in, in the States. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's even like a, a, you know, social slash psychological thing, you know, you want to get along with the people around you, you know, like, you don't <laughs> want to, I, I don't want to be making art for people that are, you know, thousands of kilometers away. Uh, so, of course, that is one reason, but, but I mean, I have to say, I mean, I'm, and maybe this this goes to 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 the other question that that you are also asked, that which is that. So one of the one of the things that we have coming from Latin America, uh, uh, and then you know, either leaving the states or using the the English language, uh, is that you, you feel like a like a political tension inside because it's. it's um, um, you know, we all know that the relationship between uh, the United States and Latin America wasn't particularly healthy for, for Latin America. And so choosing English, of course, is a way of entering to, into the global conversation. But on the other hand, uh, uh, you don't feel uh, a comfortable do it. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and the same process, and this is, this is where I wanted to go, and, the same process seems to have happened with uh, the avant-garde movement in the, you know, at least from the starting in the middle of the 20th century. And this is something that uh, Andrea Junta, uh, an, an Argentinian uh, 
uh, uh, researcher, uh, she expressed it very well, and which was that there is this tension in, in Latin America uh, where in one, so in the one hand, they were using this avant-garde movement, mostly in that moment from the state, uh, um, but on the other hand, whereas those avant-garde movements in, in the state were apolitical or somehow mm -hmm. apolitical, and you know, like the art to the art and all this stuff, you know. Uh, um, in Latin America, they were usually uh, uh, political. And, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the reason that Andrea Junta uh, uh, gives, or at least she tries to give, uh, you know, an account of why this could have been the case. And uh, basically she says that it has to do with the extension of, on the one hand, receiving something in a language that you do want to speak, but on the other hand, mm -hmm. it's trying to, you know, uh, 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 um, show your, your position in regard to it. Um, and I think that this is very particularly interesting for Latin America being a continent which was on the on the on the, on the you know on one hand was conquered uh, you know all the things that we already know but on the other hand most people in Latin America have at least uh, a little bit of European blood so it's not that we are actually 100 percent from that or it's not that we you know uh, you know there are people that are 100% from there, but most of us are not. So it's, it's even, even in who we are, it's, we have this tension, you know, between uh, mm -hmm. being against colonialism, being against this type of uh, 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 movement over other societies, other civilizations. But on the other hand, uh, we, are, uh, we are actually part of this. You know, it's not that we are totally excluded, we are not totally Innocent, you know. So it, I don't know. It, I think that there is this tension between these these same languages, avant-garde, you know, uh, cultures, colonialism. That is, uh, at least for Latin America, is particularly interesting. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And technology. Excuse me. And technology as well, as, yeah, as something totally. that yeah. that comes from yeah. from the north. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 totally. Okay, one hundred percent. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we we have been. Uh, it's interesting this sort of longer history of colonialization that uh, you you bring up to this conversation because we we have been reading uh, the work of Jason Moore, who was your, we just interviewed a few days ago about the capital scene. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with his work, as well as other researchers discussing the contemporary period as it relates to climate change and other larger material changes. Um, in our previous uh, interview with Eugenio Tuselli, who you also know very well, he proposed Donna Haraway's term, the plantation scene when discussing his interest yeah. in the material repercussions of modern progress as a way of drawing attention to the planetary effects of extractive practices, monoculture development and things like that. Mm -hmm. So your work doesn't discuss this larger planetarily, I mean, earthly, if you wish, phenomena, but you do have some work that is interested in the political transformations and changes in the Americas, in Argentina in particular, but also broadly that denounces fake news, for example, or your latest work, um, I Can't Breathe, of course, in relation to George Floyd's um, terrible death, um, murder, really. So what was your intention creating these works? And what do you think it's the place of the arts in political protest? Well, I mean, uh, the, the, the piece, uh, it's going to be a I don't know what is the reception of that piece, but I have to say that it's a piece that every time that I actually, you know, see it again, I really, I don't know, I really feel that uh, 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 that space of, you know, just brutality, you know, that, uh, that how long, you know, because basically, I don't know if anyone uh, knows the piece, that basically it's a piece that goes to black, uh, in eight minutes and 40, 40, 47 
or six seconds, which is the time that this uh, police officer had a knee on on his neck. And 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 I I, I actually I have to say like I I, act, I every time that I see the piece I I feel something. I, of course, it's weird to say that about a work of uh, that, that you did. But, but I don't know. It's, it's um, but in that sense, that piece and another piece that I have about a similar event in Argentina about the death of Santiago Maldonado, uh, in, in some sense, those pieces are very clear. Those just like, you know, I'm just talking about what is obvious there, you know? Um, uh, but the pieces that I actually are more interested uh, in which I don't have many, but I would I would like to have more. Are for instance that that piece that you said, uh, you know, that, 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 that you mentioned the one like it's about uh, fake news, which is a Twitter post, bot, and stuff like that. Because what I do like about that is the fact, and and which is something that I actually like about in general generative literature, but particularly about that one. That basically is a piece that combines a uh, 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 headline from uh, conservative news outlet. And what I do like about those pieces is, that of course, people that actually like those news outlets they don't they don't they don't they don't uh, read my piece. So it's usually people that don't like them. And what I do think that is good, and, and, and it's something that, as I mentioned before, is something that I'm thinking on a lot lately is the fact that it seems that we don't have this common space to hear something unexpected, to hear something that is not, uh, you know, in the set of things that we, in our groups, we uh, uh, already assume that is, you know, it, it is what is correct and what is acceptable and what is good and right. And, and we don't have, anything uh, uh, we don't listen to people that say something unexpected anymore and which is mm -hmm. very important because basically uh, of course this is this this may be wrong but my 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 sensation is that we came from a, a historic a long historical period where you know truth was guaranteed by you know, god or whatever it was and then we realized with many philosophical movements that uh, uh, you know, truth is a more complex thing, and probably it's not even grounded in something certain. But the fact is that the result of this, uh, 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 the construction of the notion of truth, is that we don't have a way of, we didn't find so far a way of uh, uh, um, solving our differences without, you know, being violent or being imposing our power or something like that. We don't have that common ground that before it was easy, but it's like, oh, God said it, and that was, that was it. And the fact that I think that there is a learning in like humankind, I don't know. <laughs> we have to find a way of resolving this, this uh, conflict. We have to find a way of talking with people that like Trump. I know that it seems impossible, but we have to find that. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, in, in these literary productions, uh, where people suddenly read something that they weren't expecting, the, the fact that you, you are exposing people to something that wasn't in their mental, you know, in the, in their set of things that were acceptable, I think there is at least a step in that direction of, you know, making us more open to, to, to hear something that maybe we, didn't, we don't like, but, you know, maybe we can discuss it, I don't know. I don't know, maybe I'm being nice back here. I don't know. <laughs> this is how I feel about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah no, that's, that's excellent. Um, yeah. Last question, I think. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a two-point question. This is an easy one. <laughs> um, um, and it has to do with Borges. Uh, obviously, the, the, the work of Jorge Luis Borges is very present in your work. Uh, and I mean, there's pieces particularly like Aleph Autocorregido, Aleph a Dieta, etc. And, and we're curious because, uh, I mean, uh, 
Borges obviously continues to be a huge reference for anything that has to do with, um, uh, I don't know, ideas of bifurcation, ideas of permutation, ideas of infinity uh, or the infinite and so on that are so, um, uh, that have still a very central role in, um, in, in works of uh, electronic literature. So I wonder if you could talk about your interest in his work and your treatment of his work and its relevance uh, to digital literary arts. And also, if I might add something too, we're also talking about a different type of politics because you're also talking about, you know, uh, literary traditions, canonizations, you know, when you think of Borges yes. and you're an Argentinian writer. So that's, yes. you know, an obvious type of political reference in your work that you're also engaging yes. with, you know, by mm -hmm. engaging directly with works that you do change. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, um, I, I'm going to start with the, the, this last uh, part of the question because, of course, uh, uh, sometimes that for me is amazing is the fact that the, what is for some people considered the, the first uh, 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 work of liter uh, electronic literature, which is a stochastic text uh, by Theo uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the year 59. Um, uh, one interesting thing about this piece is that there is nothing particularly Kafkian about that piece, but he took some words from uh, the the capsule, the, the the novel The Capsule by Kafka, and but then the, the you know the the the, the combinational uh, aspect of it is very simple, and the fact that he said that the words were taken from this. Uh, 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 a novel, in a way, it could be read as that, you know, an attempt of, to justify the the the, the literature, the literature, uh, literary I don't know, aspect of this of this piece, because um, in itself it doesn't it, it's not very it doesn't sound very interesting. Um, so, and it's something that in literature we do all the time, like you know, this reference to also to a different authors, usually in the canon, as a way of proving that the you know the piece that I'm presenting belongs to the long tradition of literature. So mm -hmm. that you are doing that, literature. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Which is interesting because in the case of that particular piece by by Theo Lutz, it, it's it seems kind of a joke, you know, like, it's kind of funny, <laughs> but, um, but, but yeah, I mean, it, uh, that's what he said. And um, so th that, I think that that is related with, with the, the thing that Alex was asking, because, yeah, I mean, in digital literature, this has been done. I don't think that now that li digital literature, or electronic literature, uh, you know, has the has become a, has become a more important, you know, it has some uh, 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 feel of its own, but probably until even like 10 years ago, people were still doing that because it was a way of proving that that was literature, that wasn't just, you know, uh, uh, you know nonsense. And, so that was an interesting thing, in, 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 like historical thing in, in terms of digital literature. Of course, Borges, because of uh, uh, all the, you know, the, the idea of this forking path, the idea of uh, well, the, the Library of Babel, you know, this, the, combin the, the total combination of the entire, uh, the, the, any possible language, etc. He's, he's like an an icon for, for, for electronic literature, of course. And then I have this double uh, uh, problem because on the one hand I do digital literature and on the other hand, on the other hand I come from Argentina, which is a place that is already uh, doomed by Borges. Everybody, either, <laughs> they, either, either they try to write like him, which is very easy because he basically had a, a manual of his style. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> I mean, 
the, the hard part is to create that manual, but what is done is, is easy to follow. So it, it, and there are many people that write like Borges in Argentina, or they try to totally, uh, you know, differentiate themselves from, from Borges, which is also hard. So uh, in Argentina, it's particularly a problem, uh, uh, Borges. So I have both from the, the side of electronic literature and from the side of UNR from Argentina. Um, the only thing that I can say is, uh, in, in terms of my relationship with him is that, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, um, it's some, someone that I started reading very, very young. I, I think that I was 12 or 13 when I started reading him. And I instantly became addicted to, it, to, to, to his work. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, if there is one person in this world that I still know by heart, a lot of text is by, you know, the text that okay. he did, <laughs> he wrote. So, it's, uh, I don't know, he's everywhere in my life. I, I have to say that, yeah. 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 And something that Elik and I have thought about before is how, that, you know, um, we're very interested in it and how Borges can create certain, I think uh, Elika called it media objects, right? I mean, he creates, he, he envisions these objects that in a way, you know, perform a function in the, in the literature. And then you, by creating these works of electronic literature, you carry that task out, right? You enact the imaginary, you know, labyrinthian structures that he describes, you actually put them to play and you enact them in digital literature, right? So you, you carry out those uh, figurative uh, objects. And that's really something that it's because of the medium is really interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, totally, I mean, it is, it's, yeah. He, he, yeah, he was foreseeing a lot of the things that we, are, we can actually do right now and that kind of amazing. On the other hand, it makes you feel very bad because like, okay, he already thought about this, we are just doing it. <laughs> uh, but, but, but that's um, that's the role of the arts according to you know my friend walter benjamin so they just yeah. prefigure everything uh, else so. no and uh, someone uh, else that we've been reading in class is uh Siegfried Selinsky and this exploration of these concepts that continue to be recurrent i mean exactly. in general just from yeah. for media archaeology this this these ideas or concepts that continue to appear and come back in what he calls the deep time of the media so I mean, I'm sure Borges, I mean, I'm sure not, like we know that Borges has like a lot of sources too that lead him to that. So it's just there. Uh, yeah. I mean, to think about it as, you know, kind of like sticky principles that continue to be very interesting through different points in time and and material and media history. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and on the other hand, and, and, and I'm going to ask you, I'm sorry for this, but I'm going to ask you to translate this because I cannot right now. But uh, one sentence is that he, he, he wrote many times, I have to say, uh, of everything that he wrote. And, and, and he said, like, uh, I'm going to say this in Spanish, but uh, um, uh, no existe un, una obra humana que no sea deleznable, pero, mm -hmm. su, su, eje, pero su ejecución no lo es. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you can translate that after, but basically, uh, you know, at least we are doing, we are executing his, his command. So that's, <laughs> that's something. Sí. Uh, yeah, I think we, in esta nota de lesnable, we're going to end this conversation. <laughs> thank you so much. For staying thank you so much, us. Milton. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your, and the, all the questions were great. Uh, we're very, very happy yeah, to have we'll, you. We're good at questions. <laughs> <It's nothing else. laughs> right. Bye for now. Thank you, Milton. Thank you. Uh,